He never changes.
your name. This is a song we've done a couple times. And this is a song from the perspective of the Father speaking to you this morning. See, before you were even born, he knew you. And he had a plan for your life. And he loved you. And he created you and knit you together in your mother's womb. That's what the song's about. Let's sing it this morning. You and I have got history. We go way, way back. We go way, way back. See, you and I have got history. Way, way back. 
you before I ever made you. I wrote every moment down. You were on my idea above all I created. You were my most precious crown. You and I.
matter what you've been through. He never left you for a second, no. Father, just wrap around you right now in the name of Jesus. testify that once you've experienced the love of Jesus, nothing else will do. Nothing else will do. Nothing else comes close. And you may have been out in the world for a long time and tried a bunch of things, but what you experience, the unfailing love of Jesus, everything else just pales in comparison. 
and the things of earth grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Remember that song? Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Thank you, thank him for his presence here. We love you, Jesus. Say that one time. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. You're a wonderful Savior. Somebody in this room is going to meet him for the first time today, and that, that always excites me. I hope it's always exciting to me that people get to be introduced to the Savior in the person of Jesus Christ who's here this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your grace. Thank you that we're never too far. Thank you that the offer still stands. That that glorious exchange can still take place. Let your name be glorified and your will be done in this place today. Pray special blessing and protection on everyone here. And let your spirit move. Give us, give us the hearts that are prepared to accept what your will is for us today, God. Let us listen and obey this morning. We bless your name. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Somebody say amen today. Hug somebody before you sit down. Is anybody excited to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Amen. We are so blessed that you are here this morning. And um, the Lord was just reminding me during worship, there are thousands and maybe even millions of people uh, in other countries where what we're doing this very moment is completely illegal and people who are risking their lives just to come to the house of the Lord. And here we are, we get to do this in a place of freedom. And so I'm so thankful for that. And so if this is your new time, uh, your first time here, excuse me, we are going to enter into our part of tithes and offerings. And so there's three easy, convenient ways you can give, whether it's on FOTN.org, through our text mobile giving, or through the envelope sitting in front of you. So however you're giving this morning, uh, let's be obedient, expectful, and cheerful as we give this to the Lord this morning. Uh, let's go ahead and pray. God, we just call upon your faithfulness, Lord, and I thank you that our shortcomings and failures don't shake who you are, Lord. We thank you that you are constant, that you are steady, and again, you are so faithful, Lord. And so I pray that your faithfulness and your goodness would compel our hearts to be in a rightful posture of sowing eternal seeds, Lord, through our financial giving and our obedience this morning, Lord. We thank you for every um, dollar, every penny that is being sown this morning, and we thank you that you're using it and you're multiplying it um, so that the lost may be saved and that you're literally using it to change the lives around the world. And so we offer this to you this morning. We thank you, Father, that you give exceedingly and abundantly all we can begin to imagine or even think about, God. And so, Lord, we want to trust you this morning, Lord. We hold your plans. Uh, we hold your plans tightly and our plans loosely, Lord. And we just ask for your will to be done in this service this morning. We thank you. We love you. In Jesus' name, we pray. And all the passionate people said, Amen. Thank you for joining us here today at Fellowship of the Nations. Here's some things we have coming up. We hope you've been enjoying our At The Movie series. Remember, you can catch up on all these great messages on the Fellowship of the Nations YouTube channel. 
The Defenders Men's Retreat is coming up the weekend of September 13th through 14th at Lake Tomahawk. And there are still a few spots open. The cost is just $100 and includes meals and lodging. There will be great teaching by Pastors Johnny and Locke, plus worship, outdoor activities like zip lining and fishing, and great food. The only question left to answer is, are you man enough? Our annual FOTN Family Day and Barbecue is coming up on September the 15th, featuring the Chad Ware Band at the North Shore Rotary Pavilion. Barbecue plates for all are just $5 each, so sign up to bring a dessert to share and invite your family and friends to join you. Tickets are on sale in the foyer, so pick yours up today. The 2020 Breathe Women's Retreat at Crystal Beach is February the 7th through the 9th. The cost is just $200 and payments are due to be finalized by September the 15th. You can pay online or at the Welcome Center. And everybody, go out and have a great week. Good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing? Y'all good? Good, good, man. I'll tell you, isn't it better being in here in a cool room than it is outside? Come on, somebody. Yeah. <laughs> or at our house. Our air conditioner went out last night. What? Anyway, uh, so we, hey, we sweat for Jesus. It's all right. We've been to Panama. It doesn't bother us. Anyway, if you're here for the first time, we greet you in the name of Jesus. Glad you are here. And uh, you may be in, looking around saying, man, why are they eating popcorn in church and what is this? Well, August is our movie month, and uh, we've been doing that all uh, month long. And now uh, we have a special guest here in a moment I will introduce who's going to be, uh, who's going to be bringing the message. But I, uh, I want to say welcome to you. If you have not been um, involved in our men's retreat yet, uh, let me just give you a special invitation. And here's what I want you to do, all right? How many men we got here? How many men? How many mighty men we got? Come on, raise them out. Okay. I would like to meet with you right after the service, right up here for about five minutes. About five minutes, that's it. All right, but I want to meet every man up here and just talk to you just for a second about our retreat that's coming up, and uh, we want to get that going. Second thing is the reason why we do the, uh, the movie month, and, and next month is going to be our back to church month, and so we really want to focus on our friends and our family. So we have a beautiful table set up, Beverly, thank you very much for setting the table up, great job, but we are, we're selling barbecue tickets, right, and let me tell you, at under what it actually costs us. It's only $5 for a barbecue dinner. You can't get that anywhere, all right? But the reason why we do that is we want for you to invite your family to come because we're going to be here on September the 15th. We're going to be here in service, and then we're going out to the Rotary Pavilion over on Wallaceville, and we're going to have a barbecue. We've got the Chad Ware Band's going to be there, and so it's going to be great. This is what I'm asking you folks. I want everybody just to listen to me. I'm asking that you would do something. We're going to be doing the same thing, so I'm not going to ask you to do anything that we're not doing. I would like for you to invest $25, which is buy five tickets that you will give away to your family and your friends and say, will you join me for that Sunday, September 15th? It's a barbecue. That lady right back there has the tickets, all right? She will be out there in the foyer immediately following. All right, this, listen, I believe someone's soul is worth more than a $5 ticket, right? And if you just take $25, if, hey, maybe you can only do two tickets, whatever. But I'm just saying, for us, we're going we're gonna to buy five tickets, and I'll be looking for people who I'm going to be giving those tickets to because I want them to come because I want them to be saved. I want them to get to know all of you wonderful people. And, uh, and we're just going to have a great, great day, all right? So does that make sense? Uh, everybody excited about it? Say Amen. Woo, that's what I like. All right. Well, let's, let's give a big old warm welcome to our online congregation. Glad you're watching today. 
And uh, anybody got the word? Word up. Let's hold it in the air like you really, really care. Say it together. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. It is a lamp to my feet, a light into my path. I will hide his word in my heart so that I might not sin against God. Holy Spirit, give me ears to hear and strength to obey in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. All right. Well, our special guest today is the love of my life. And uh, some of you may not know this, but this lady who sings awesome and plays the keyboards is my wife. And uh, woo, come on, somebody, is my beautiful wife. We have, uh, we've been uh, married for 38 years. I'm 37. I don't know how that happens. And uh, any, anyway, we got three wonderful sons and five grandchildren. And I'm going to tell you, this sweet lady right here has been a joy in my life. And, and for me to come up about 20 years ago, a little over 20 years ago, hey, God is calling us to plant a church. And for her to get on board and say, okay, I'll follow you. That is a God thing. And I'll tell you what, we've been, we've been doing this, and it's, this is my helpmate. And I'm telling you, when things are high, things are low, things cruise and whatever, she is a blessing. What? I told her, I said, if, if you ever leave me, I'm going with you. So uh, anyway, she stayed around. Let's give a big old welcome to Miss Lisa Brady. Thank you. Thank you. I'm one of these people that... When I'm warm, I have to say it. I have to say I'm hot. I'm hot, you know. And Don Rosecrans always, always says, quit bragging. I don't know why he says that, but I've been, I've been warm for a couple of days. We, our, our, air, our air did go out, and when we went to bed last night, it was 80 degrees in my house. Now, those, some of you are like, well, I set my air conditioner on 80 degrees. Well, don't invite me over because I want to <laughs> We, we, we rigged up some, a fan system because we have a little studio in our house and it has cold air. And we, so we rigged up the fans to somehow get into our bedroom. So it made it about 76 degrees, which I'm sorry, is about 8 degrees too warm still for, for night sleeping. Can the mature women in the church give me an amen? amen. All right. <laughs> well, I am so excited to get this opportunity to speak. I do this once a year. I do it with great honor because it is a privilege to stand in this pulpit. It is a blessing and an honor from the Lord to be able to speak to you this morning. I'm not a preacher. Am I speaking loud enough? I'm not a preacher. I am uh, a storyteller somewhat. So I'm going to try to open up this. If, if you have seen the movie Hoosiers, would you just raise your hand? Okay, this, this movie came out about, what, Locke, 86, 88, 84? It's an old movie, but it's a true story, and it's a great movie. It's been dubbed by a lot of people as the greatest sports movie that's ever made, and it's on Netflix right now. It's a good, clean, uh, family-type movie for you to watch with your family, so it's great. Uh, but Hoosiers is a true story about a basketball team in rural Indiana back in 1951, many, many years before I was born. <laughs> Who's laughing? I want your name. And this team rises from obscurity with the help of a new coach who comes with some baggage and a checkered past. How many of you could say, you don't have to raise your hands, but I've had a checkered, I got a checkered past. You know, that means you got, you got baggage, you got stuff, you got mistakes and regrets that you have about things you've done. He's an unlikely candidate for this job since he's an older man. He's like in his mid-50s. I don't think that's old, but, uh, and he's been in the Navy for 10 years. And the people in, his town, in this town aren't too keen on him because basketball is like a religion in Indiana. And they like doing things a certain way. Like one of the first things they, the townspeople asked him was, are you going to do a zone defense or man-to-man? -man? I mean, that's like they didn't even know his last name, and they're asking him about that. They care about these things. And small towns are really big on this kind of stuff. I don't know if you know this. I'm from a small town, and uh, football was everything in my town. So I, I really understand where he was coming from. But Norman Dale is his name, and he isn't one to jump through hoops to win people's approval. Uh, as you'll see in this first clip, where he's about to have his first basketball practice with the team.
So this is what Southerners call upsetting the apple cart. <laughs> Sometimes following God's call in your life requires you to shake things up a bit. Someone once said that the last seven words of the church are, we've never done it that way before. We like to keep things the way they are. We don't like change. Churches don't seem to anyway. You, but you can't stay where you are and follow God too. I promise you it will cost you something. It will cost you everything. It may drag you kicking and screaming out of your comfort zone. And doing God's will requires movement. It requires sacrifice. It may mean that you are not the most popular girl at the dance. It might mean that you are friendless. Just remember that you always have a friend in Jesus. The word says that he is a friend that sticks closer than a brother, and he will never leave you and never forsake you. But when you're doing the right thing, many times people won't understand. Even good Christian people, they will not understand because God has told you to do something, and you're doing it his way, not their way. It won't make sense to them, and they will criticize you for it. This is one of the reasons why I think a lot of people sit in the pew and don't ever get involved, because that is a risk-free zone. But what you're risking is you're losing on the opportunity to do and be what God has destined you to be. Pastor Johnny is always saying, when you know who you are, you will know what to do. And when you begin to do that and you begin to walk in the calling he has for your life, and he does have a calling for each and every one of us, you will finally understand what true joy is. But people will criticize you if you don't do things their way. They may even try to ruin you, but whatever God's plan, whatever God has for you to accomplish, you must stick to it. No matter what, people may not understand. The world will hate you. Jesus told us the world would hate us. In John 15, 18 and 19, it says, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belonged to the world, it would love you as its own. So that's kind of a good thing to remember. If everything is smooth sailing all the time, you may want to check, am I really following God's plan? Am I really doing it his way? Because you are going to encounter some obstacles with people, both in the church and outside the church. And then in James 4, it says, don't you know that flirting with the world's values places you at odds with God? Whoever chooses to be the world's friend makes himself God's enemy. That's a strong statement by the brother of Jesus. A lover of the world is the enemy of God. So we got to do it God's way from start to finish. And God is a very specific God. He doesn't just throw you into something without a plan. He has very specific, specific instructions for each of us. If you look at what Noah went through, he had the plan, the blueprint for that ark down to the last nail. And God has a blueprint for your life as well. But you can't be a man pleaser and please God too. And Normandale gives us a fine example in this next clip. Just love that so much. I will have one question. Why were the cheerleaders' skirts down to here, but the basketball team's shorts? Somebody help them. I've seen a picture of Johnny Brady in some short shorts like that on the basketball court. And they wore the Chuck Taylor high tops just like that. No arch support, nothing. But they were red for Mustangs, red. <laughs> now, did you see that playbook in his hand? That's the plan. He had a plan, all right? They didn't, you can see all those guys clapping on the sidelines when Ray was making the points. He had told them, pass the ball four times before you shoot. He's trying to build something with these people. He's trying to discipline them. He's trying to break them down and build them up to what he wants them to be because he knows what a championship team looks like because he had coached championship teams before. But that playbook was his plan, the plan to make that ragtag team of six kids into a championship team. Throughout the film, you'll see him raise it up for people to see. It's the standard by which he is measuring his own success as a coach regardless of the score on the scoreboard. God's word is our playbook. 
It is the standard blueprint by which we are to measure everything we attempt or hope to accomplish for God's glory. It takes character to stick to what you know is right. It won't make sense to others, maybe even other Christians, but don't let that sway you from doing the right thing. Keep your eyes on the prize. Focus on the eternal, not the temporal. Nothing is as important as obeying the voice of the Holy Spirit. Nothing is as important as obeying the voice of the Holy Spirit. And if you say, well, I've never heard him speak, well, have you read his word? Because when you begin to know God's word, you begin to know him, and his spirit will speak it to you. And it becomes very specific and very clear. I had someone tell me yesterday, she called me on the phone, she said, I have to tell you about what happened. She went somewhere, I think it was to a Goodwill store, and she saw a woman in there, and she worked there, and she said, could you tell me about, um, could you pray for my son? Her son also worked there. And she said, what's going on? And she told him that he had a heart condition and that it looked very bad. He was young. He was like 17. It looks bad. I mean, the doctors don't know what they're going to do. And she said, I, I, knew I, I knew I should pray for her, but I just, it, it made me uncomfortable. So I started not to, but then I did. I went ahead. I said, can I just pray for you right now? And she prayed for the boy with the mother. The next day she called her and she said, you're not going to believe what happened. She said, 20 minutes after you called, he got released from the hospital. He's okay. And I said, obeying God's voice is everything. It can really mean life or death for somebody. So we've got to become in tune to his voice, and we've got to stick to the playbook. We've got to stick to the plan. Because not only will you be unpopular with those around you, but you will be asked to do things that are utterly outside the realm of conventional thinking. One of the players on Coach Dale's team, the Hickory Huskers, has a father who's an alcoholic. He's known as the town drunk, and he's an embarrassment to his son. He's a former high school basketball star, played by Dennis Hopper, who is still trying to make sense of the shot he missed that cost the team a chance to go to the state finals some 20 years earlier. But Coach sees something valuable in this man. He knows a lot about basketball, first of all. And even though the whole town has written him off, he cares enough about him to offer him a chance at redemption. Next clip. I remember when Johnny, you guys might know him. He's my husband, the love of my life. He's here today. I'm imitating Stephanie. He's here today. <laughs> hey, sweetie. He came to me one day, and he said God was talking to him, which is always kind of scary. You know, God's been talking to me. You're like, ooh. Said God was telling him to start a small group-based church and said that God was asking him to leave the job that provided for our family and launch out into deep water. And he said God instructed him that we couldn't ask anyone to come with us. Um, that we had to start from scratch. And my first reaction was, oh no. <laughs> now mind you, we had been in ministry together for 18 years at this point, and I thought I knew the score. I thought I knew what it would cost me, but I had no clue what was ahead of us or the price we would have to pay, what it would cost my children the onslaught of our unseen enemy, none of it. But I knew in that moment this was something we must do and that God will walk us through every step. I've never regretted our decision to follow this path. I know it was God's plan all along, and he gets all the glory for anything that has ever taken place in this vision. But sometimes God will ask you to include others in his plan, unlikely people, People who on the surface seem unworthy, unqualified, and nowhere near ready. He will do this so that he can redeem someone like Shooter. That was his name. He will do this so he alone can receive the glory. He will use unlikely people. Think about where you were a year ago, or five years ago, or ten. Think about the long, hard road that you've traveled and the mistakes and bumps and bruises that you've incurred along the way. Think of all the times you felt like giving up 
or felt like it was just too hard, so you wanted to quit. Think about all the times you did quit and went back to that broken cistern to drink and found it so unsatisfying. Think about the times you threw in the towel and then with bitter tears, you pick the towel back up and you wash the feet of Jesus so you could go back to serving him and him alone. Was it worth it? Do you regret loving him? Do you regret giving your heart to Jesus and accepting his forgiveness and grace? Of course not. How could we? Jesus chose his 12 disciples from a motley crew of guys who did not fit the mold of world changers. <laughs> he chose at least four fishermen. Okay, you could just stop right there. <laughs> he just chose four fishermen, a despised tax collector, a zealot. Today we might label Simon the Zealot as Antifa. And even one disciple who ended up betraying him. Hey, it's good to know that even when Jesus chooses his squad, there's liable to be a bad apple in the bunch, right? You're not going to get everything right. In 1 Corinthians 1, it says, Brothers and sisters, consider who you were when God called you to salvation. He wants you to really think about this. Not many of you were wise scholars by human standards, nor were many of you in positions of power. Not many of you were considered the elite when you answered God's call, but God chose those whom the world considers foolish to shame those who think they are wise. And God chose the puny and the powerless to shame the high and the mighty. He chose the lowly, the laughable in the world's eyes, nobodies, so that he would shame the somebodies. For he chose what is regarded as insignificant in order to supersede what is regarded as prominent so that there would be no place for prideful boasting in God's presence. So it's almost a prerequisite that if God's going to use you, you've got to be kind of a loser, right? I mean, honestly, you've got to kind of be like that unlikely person that nobody, but that you get picked last for the basketball team maybe. So, Coach Normandale has his eye on the greater prize. Even when they're losing, he would do things like this. He would take somebody that was shooting well, he'd take them out because they weren't doing it his way. He didn't care about the W or the L. He wanted to get his plan across. So, he, he was, his eye was on the greater prize, not just making these boys into men and building a championship team, but seeing the diamond in the rough of Shooter his new assistant. Shooter has a few missteps on his road to sobriety. And coach tells him at one point, we're finally coming together as a team. All the Pistons are firing. We've got 10 games to play. We're going to be a tough team to beat. Now you come along for the ride. And Shooter says, you have got to give me your word that you will not get thrown out of no games. That's how he said it because he kept getting thrown out of games because he had a temper. And he did not want to be on that bench without his coach, he said. But, but coach has a plan that is bigger than winning games. Oh, there's nothing like seeing somebody else get to rise up and take their place. If you haven't mentored anybody before, you need to do it. You need to pour your life into somebody and influence them and let them see that anything is possible if they will devote themselves to God. Sometimes we have to allow ourselves to be taken out so someone else can rise. President Harry Truman said, it's amazing what you can accomplish if you do not care who gets the credit. But I'll go you one truer than that. Nothing is impossible if you let God, God have all the credit. If you let him have everything, nothing is impossible if you let God have all the credit. He will take you farther than you ever dreamed. This little girl from Groves, Texas, got to watch God building churches in Cambodia this summer. By the way, every one of you who tithe faithfully have a part in that. You were there with us. 
you're in that brick and mortar. You're in that foundation that's going up. You're in that equipping of those young pastors. And the people that come to faith in Christ because of those churches going up, they're going to know you in heaven. They're going to be able to say thank you. Thank you for being obedient to God because I'm here because of you. So what's your dream? Are you willing to step aside for someone else to rise? Mark 9, 35 says, Jesus sat down and called the 12 disciples to come around him, and he said to them, if anyone wants to be first, he must be content to be last and become a servant of all. As soon as I realized it's not about me, I began to do impossible things. So I want you to look at your neighbor and say, it's not about me, it's about Jesus. It's about Jesus, amen? All right, let's watch this next clip, and then we'll talk about it. Ollie considered himself as less than a real member of the team and more of an equipment manager. In the very beginning, when he first started with this team, there were only six. And one of the boys got mad and left, so that left just five. One player even referred to him as half a player. <laughs> he was small, not very good at basketball. But Coach Dale believed in him. Have you ever had someone believe in you that way? give you a chance, someone who saw greatness in you even though it wasn't apparent to anyone else. That's how God sees you all the time. He sees nothing but potential and perfection in you, not because of anything you've done, but only because of what his son Jesus Christ did for you on the cross. When it mattered most, Ollie stepped up and faced his fears and shortcomings and he cleared the mechanism so he could focus on what was ahead of him, a championship. Others saw a murderer and a coward in Moses, but God saw one who would lead millions of Hebrews out of Pharaoh's bondage to slavery. Others saw a weak and blinded has-been in Samson, but God saw the one who would bring vengeance on God's enemies. Others saw a shepherd boy in David, but God saw a giant slayer and a king. Others saw a carpenter's son born of an unmarried woman, but God saw the savior of all mankind. Amen. Amen. God sees greatness in you. God sees greatness in you. Anytime you begin to feel overwhelmed by the size of the task God has assigned to you, just remember that perspective and perception are two very different things. I remember driving to see my childhood home recently, and I smiled as I recalled how much bigger it all seemed when I was a kid. Y'all know what I'm talking about? As a child, the front yard seemed about an acre in size, and the house felt enormous, and the drainage ditch that ran along the side of our property seemed as deep as a river. In reality, it was so much smaller. My perception has changed considerably in 50 years. Watch how Coach Dale gives this new perspective to the perception of the size of the task at hand. They're going to the state finals. Getting God's perspective on your mission magnifies God's size and power and makes any task manageable. He's a mighty big God with unlimited power and understanding. Isaiah 55 says this, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, declared the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. If you're hearing God speak to you about something right now regarding your area of ministry or what God wants you to do with your life now that you're serving him, could you just raise your hand if God's dealing with you about something? That's good. We all ought to be raising our hands because God is dealing with you. You're just not listening. You're like, shut up. And he can get loud. He will get your attention. But do you have questions? My advice to you is this. If you have a question about what God is asking you to do, be willing to be thought foolish. Do it his way, start to finish. Surround yourself with godly counsel. Keep your circle of trust very small. Everybody doesn't need to know what God's saying to you. 
because people will, they'll run it down because there's jealous people everywhere. Love everybody, though. Guard your heart with all diligence. Proverbs 4.23 says that's where all the issues of life flow from, is from that heart. Never think you have it all figured out. Trust me, you don't. Wait, wait, wait on the Lord. Wait some more. Trust his ways. He will take you places beyond your wildest dream. And the last piece of advice is, to honor and love those who have taken the journey with you. You didn't get there alone. So we're going to watch this last clip. When you're committed to the vision God's given you and you've done it with integrity and humility, the only thing left to do is recognize the people who've helped you along the way and honor them. Let them know how you feel that you love them, that they are valuable to you and necessary to your work. This story is kind of a David and Goliath type story because back then they didn't have uh, divisions according to the size of a school. There wasn't like 4A, 5A. There was just all the high schools competed for this one tournament. And somehow this little team in the whitest town I've ever seen in my life <laughs> They got to go to the state championship. God has a plan for you like that. You may be seeing yourself the way they saw themselves in the beginning, that they were a long shot with not a lot of possibility. But with God and you do things his way, all things are possible to you. Amen? Would you stand with me? Let's pray together. Thank you so much for being a part of our online streaming. I hope you really enjoyed the message today. And I want you to just take it to heart. Whatever the Lord has spoken to you, just take it to heart. And, and I pray that if you have never received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that today would be that day. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. So that's what we're praying for you. And if you wondered, how do I get to know Jesus as my Lord and Savior? Well, let me tell you, it's pretty simple. First of all, Jesus loves you more than anybody on this planet. So let me tell you, he's wanting you to know him. So as you come to him, we recognize, one, that we've sinned against God. Everybody has. The Bible says that all have sinned. We've fallen short of the glory of God. Well, we recognize that one. We don't have to be told that. We know that. The second thing is, it says that God demonstrated his love for us, and that's you. God loves you even though that we were sinners. That's how much he cares for you. So you got to get it out of the way. He's not judging you. He already sent his son to die in our place so that we could have all of our sin placed upon him. And then we believe we had faith in him that that's what he did. And he did it because he loved us. The Bible says the wages of our sin is death. Well, Jesus took our death sentence for us. But then it doesn't leave it as a negative. It says, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus. It's not works. It's not a a church membership somewhere. It's not giving money to somebody. All of those are good things, but this not, does not bring salvation. So now, how do you get there? It's only in Jesus. So simply just open your heart and say, Jesus, I'm a sinner. Please forgive me of my sin. Come into my heart. Save me. Forgive me. I want to turn away from all the stupid stuff that I'm doing. And I want to turn to you. I want you to be my Lord, my Savior, the boss of my life. And Jesus, come in and save me. I want to love you. I want to live for you. I want to obey your word all the days of my life. And that's what you can do. Pray that prayer right now. And I'll tell you, Jesus is waiting. And the moment, the instant you do that, you will be saved. And my encouragement to you, find a great Bible-believing, Bible-preaching church. Get connected. Now, if you're in the Houston area, man, we would love to have you at Fellowship of the Nations. But you're in different parts of the country or even around the world, Find somewhere that they're preaching Jesus, and I promise you it will change your life. Hope you can join us again next week, and uh, up until then, we'll be praying for you. Pray for us. We'd love to hear from you. Just go on our website, FOTN.org, Fellowship of the Nations, and let us hear from you. God bless you.